Hi, I understand you have experience working with stem cells, and that is great news. We can sure use you now to help us compare two different medical therapies involving stem cells. We have two different strategies currently in clinical trials to help repair the human heart. When we are approved by the Food and Drug Administration, or FDA, to begin a clinical trial, it means the therapy is being tested on human patients for the first time. We need to determine which therapy produces the best results for our patients. So here's a little background information you'll need. Heart disease is the biggest killer in the U.S., and thousands of people each year have heart attacks or develop congestive heart failure. A heart attack, also known as a myocardial infarction, occurs when one or more of the coronary arteries become blocked, failing to deliver the necessary blood to the tissue of the heart itself. When a heart attack occurs, it causes the muscle to die or be damaged. If enough of the muscle dies, then congestive heart failure can develop. This condition means that the heart is no longer able to pump enough blood out to the rest of the body, especially during exercise or other physical activity. People with congestive heart failure feel fatigued all the time, have swelling in the extremities and abdomen, and get short of breath with minimal physical activity. Click on the different blockages in the coronary arteries to see what happens to the heart. The right coronary artery supplies the bottom portion of the left ventricle and also the right ventricle in most cases. The right ventricle pumps blood to the lungs so that it can be oxygenated before the left ventricle pumps it to the rest of the body. The circumflex artery supplies the back or posterior portion of the left ventricle. The left anterior descending artery supplies blood to the front, anterior, portion of the left ventricle and the septum. Remember that the left ventricle pumps blood to the body, so it is critically important that this chamber of the heart work well. Blockages early in the left anterior descending artery, or closer to the aorta, are often called widowmakers because they can be fatal. Now that you understand the basics of myocardial infarctions, I'll turn you over to Rich Pompili, a physician that is working on several research projects that use stem cells to repair the heart. Rich? Hi. I'm a cardiologist that treats problems of the cardiovascular system, which is comprised of the heart, arteries, and veins in the body. I've long been interested in helping people recover after myocardial infarctions. We've been able to successfully stop the heart attack for a while now, but until recently, there was little that could be done to repair the heart muscle itself. Then researchers observed that stem cells were found near the damaged tissue after a heart attack. These cells actually seemed to help repair the heart. However, they disappeared after a few days and only did some minor repair work. So I got to thinking, what if you could increase the number of stem cells and the time they spent repairing the heart? Would that make a big difference to the patient? It turns out that it can make a significant difference. The stem cells do a number of things to help the heart recover after a heart attack. They increase the vascularization, or number of blood vessels available to help the heart tissue. They differentiate, or turn into new heart muscle cells. And they prevent the death of other heart cells in the damaged area and assist in their recovery. Click along the timeline to see how the heart repair changes when you expose the damaged area to additional stem cells for longer periods of time. As you can see, it would be really beneficial if we could get more stem cells into the heart after a myocardial infarction. The question is, how best to do that? There are two investigations into this question going on at the moment. We are in phase one clinical trials with both. That means we are in the first step of testing these potential therapies in human beings. There are two more sets of clinical trials that involve hundreds to thousands of patients before this therapy could be approved by the Food and Drug Administration for use in all patients needing it. One investigation involves removing stem cells from the patient's bone marrow and injecting them into the heart. Once there, they aid in repair just like the stem cells that are found there naturally. Another investigation involves using the body's own repair mechanisms and signals. 
just increasing the time and magnitude of the signal to recruit stem cells to the heart to increase the repair. Which investigation would you like to participate in first? You will be taking notes and assisting in evaluating the investigations once we gather more data. Click the one you would like to start with. Okay, for this line of research, we will start with a bone marrow aspiration to collect the stem cells. I've already prepped the patient, so we are ready to start. We'll talk a bit about why these patients are participating in this clinical trial later. For now, we have sterilized the area of the hip where we will harvest the bone marrow. The technical term is bone marrow aspiration. We will be using a thin needle to remove liquid bone marrow from a spot in the back of your hip bone called the posterior iliac crest. Pick up the syringe, insert it in the hip bone, and withdraw 100 cc's of bone marrow. Great! Now we will send the bone marrow sample out to the lab to be centrifuged, separated, and cleaned. They will then send us stem cells that are ready to be injected back into the patient. The stem cells are back and we are ready to inject them. We will do this by a procedure known as catheterization. We will go into the right femoral artery, up through the aorta, across the aortic valve, and then into the left ventricle. Our patient is a 68-year-old man with a history of heart attacks. He is now in stage 3 heart failure, meaning he is short of breath, very fatigued, and has swelling of his extremities due to lack of blood flow. This is all because the left ventricle is not performing as it should. So to try to fix this, we will inject the stem cells into the left ventricle. I have already prepped the patient, so we have a sterile field for the catheterization. Begin by locating the femoral artery. Now insert a large bore needle into the artery. Insert the 18 cm short guide wire through the needle. Now put what is called an introducer and sheath in over the wire. The introducer is a thin plastic tube that helps get through the artery. The sheath has a one-way valve to prevent blood from coming out and through which we can put all our other catheters. Pull the short guide wire and introducer out. The introducer will leave a sheath behind, which will hold the artery open for us. Insert the long guide wire. This is a thin wire that is about 100 centimeters long with a rounded end that will help us get the catheter up into the aorta, around the arch in the aorta, through the left atrium, through the aortic valve, and into the left ventricle without penetrating the arterial walls. Remember, this is an arterial system under pressure from the heart. If we penetrate the arterial wall, the patient could bleed to death internally. Now we will insert the catheter over the guide wire and advance them up the femoral artery, into the aorta, and follow the same path around the arch in the aorta, through the left atrium, across the aortic valve, and into the left ventricle. Good job! Now that we are in the ventricle, we want to check the previous images taken using contrast dye when the patient was first diagnosed. This will help us locate the damaged area. You can see there is damage caused by those heart attacks because there is a section of the heart that doesn't move. What we want to do is to carefully inject them right where the healthy tissue meets the dead tissue, or right on the line between red and white tissue. Go ahead and inject the stem cells in the appropriate locations. Before we do anything else, we need to check to see if we left a small hole or perforation in the heart by looking at the echocardiogram. Here's an image of what it looks like when there is a perforation in the heart. You can see that the black area is where blood has leaked into the pericardial sac, which is the tissue that surrounds the heart. Compare that to our patient, looking particularly at the area around the left ventricle. Do you think our patient has a hole in the heart, or are we in good shape to finish this procedure? I agree, there are no perforations in the heart. Okay, now we need to withdraw the catheter and apply pressure for about 20 minutes to prevent bleeding. A nurse will provide the pressure for us.
Excellent. Hopefully our intervention here will help this patient's heart recover some of its former functionality. We will be monitoring this for the next four months to see what happens. For this line of research, we are using the body's own systems to repair the heart by increasing the size and length of time the repair goes on. When any part of the body is damaged in any way, a cut, a bruise, or a myocardial infarction, the body sends out a signal called SDF1, or stromal cell-derived factor 1. This signal calls adult stem cells, also known as stromal cells, to the location to assist in repair. Once the stem cells reach the damaged area, they perform the functions we talked about before, vascularization, prevention of cell death, and differentiation into cells like the damaged tissue. So if we could increase the SDF1 signal at the site of the myocardial infarction and have it last longer, the heart would repair itself much more successfully. However, there are a couple of problems with this idea. The body only produces SDF1 for a few short days after the myocardial infarction. Secondly, the SDF1 would only last a short time if we injected it directly into the heart ourselves. So what we need is a way to get the heart cells to produce more SDF1 than they normally do. I've been working on a way to accomplish this. I figured out through extensive research that if you inject a plasmid, a ring of DNA that has instructions to produce SDF1, the cells of the heart will pick it up and start producing SDF1 on their own. How cool is that? My research on animal hearts indicates that the SDF1 plasmids that are integrated into the cells continue to produce the signal for up to 20 days after injection. Now we are ready to try this therapeutic technique on humans in this first clinical trial. We will do this by a procedure known as catheterization. We will go into the right femoral artery, up through the aorta, and then into the left ventricle. Our patient is a 71-year-old man with a history of heart attacks. He is now in stage 3 heart failure, meaning he is short of breath, very fatigued, and has swelling of his extremities due to lack of blood flow. This is all because the left ventricle is not performing as it should. So we will inject the plasmids into the left ventricle. I have already prepped the patient, so we have a sterile field for the catheterization. Begin by locating the femoral artery. Now insert a large bore needle into the artery. Insert the 18 cm short guide wire through the needle. Now put what is called an introducer and sheath in over the wire. The introducer helps us get through the artery wall. The sheath is a thin plastic tube with a one-way valve to prevent blood from coming out and through which we will put all our catheters. Pull the short guide wire and introducer out. The introducer will leave a sheath behind, which will hold the artery open for us. Insert the long guide wire. This is a thin wire that is about 100 centimeters long with a rounded end that will help us get the catheter up into the aorta without penetrating the arterial walls. Remember, this is an arterial system under pressure from the heart. If we penetrate the arterial wall, the patient could bleed to death internally. Then insert the catheter along the guide wire, following the same path around the arch in the aorta, through the left atrium, across the aortic valve, and into the left ventricle. Good job! Now that we are in the ventricle, we want to check the previous images taken by the doctor that originally diagnosed this patient, who used contrast dye to find the location of the damage. You can see there is damage caused by those heart attacks. Remember, we want living cells to take up the plasmid and start producing SDF1. So we will carefully inject the plasmids right where the healthy tissue meets the dead tissue, or right on the line between red and white tissue. Go ahead and inject the plasmids in the appropriate locations. Before we do anything else, we need to check to see if we left a hole in the heart by looking at the echocardiogram. Here's an image of what it looks like when there is a hole in the heart. Do you think our patient has a hole in the heart, or are we in good shape to finish this procedure? I agree. There are no holes in the heart large enough to cause any problems. Okay, now we need to withdraw the catheter and apply pressure for about 20 minutes to prevent bleeding. A nurse will provide the pressure for us. Excellent work. 
Hopefully our intervention here will help this patient's heart recover some of its former functionality. We will be monitoring this for the next four months to see. But for now, we need to look at the other investigation going on. Let's do a quick review of the tests we will be using to evaluate these two research paths. The first is ejection fraction, in this case left ventricular ejection fraction. This is the amount of blood the left ventricle pumps out to the body per beat of the heart. Many of the symptoms of congestive heart failure are caused by the body not getting enough blood flow, so this is an important indication of how well the heart is pumping blood. A normal reading is somewhere between 50 to 70 percent, usually about 55 percent, which means that 55 percent of the total amount of blood in the left ventricle is pumped out with each heartbeat. The ejection fraction is measured by echocardiography. Record the normal value on your worksheet. A stress test requires a patient to exercise on a treadmill or exercise bike while their heart rate, blood pressure, electrocardiogram, or ECG, and symptoms are monitored. A normal result of an exercise stress test shows normal electrocardiogram tracings, heart rate between 60 and 100 beats per minute, blood pressure under 120 over 80, and no chest pain, unusual dizziness, or shortness of breath. A positive result indicates that there were abnormalities in either heart rate, blood pressure, or ECG waveforms. A negative means all was normal for the patient. Record these values on your worksheet. A third test we will be performing is a six-minute walk. This is a low-tech test that simply measures how far a person can walk in six minutes. Patients with the most severe cases of heart failure might have to stop numerous times during the six minutes and are monitored to make certain this isn't too stressful for the heart. Normal range for this test is 500 meters, depending on the patient's age, height, weight, and gender. Record this on your worksheet. A fourth test we will be looking at is the Minnesota Living with Heart Failure Questionnaire. This is a 21-question test that patients fill out that measures their perception of the degree to which heart failure is impacting their lives. It asks questions about the physical and emotional aspects of living with heart failure. On this test, the lower the score, the better. Generally, 0 to 10 means the heart failure is not impacting their lives much. 50 or more means that the heart failure is severely impacting all aspects of the patient's life. We would expect these scores to be high to start with, since all patients qualifying for this clinical trial have significant problems due to heart failure. A change of 10 points or more means a significant change in quality of life. Please make a note of these values on your worksheet. We will be measuring our two patients for four months. But first, we need to look at their baseline data prior to the treatment. We will simply call these patients number one and number two to protect their anonymity during this clinical trial. Patient one is the gentleman that had the bone marrow aspiration and the stem cells injected into the heart. He is a 68-year-old male and is in stage three heart failure. That means that his symptoms are fairly bad and impacting his daily life. He is short of breath and reports he can't do a lot of the things he used to be able to do. He has also gained weight due to fluid retention in his body. The fluid accumulates because the heart is not pumping hard enough to remove fluid from the limbs. Here is the patient's data before we treated him with stem cells. Please record that information on your worksheet. Patient number two is the gentleman that went through the SDF1 signal therapy. He is a 71-year-old man and is also in stage three heart failure. Here is the baseline data for patient number two. Please record that information on your worksheet. Now that the procedures are done and a month has passed, let's see how our patients are doing. In addition to doing basic medical testing, we want to find out what they thought of the procedure. For instance, did they find it stressful or painful, or what were their thoughts? Hi, Doc. The procedure wasn't too bad. I'm not saying I'd want to go through it every day, though. Well, that bone marrow aspiration kind of hurt and deep down. I had a bruise on my hip and it hurt to bend my hip for several days after that. I also don't much like getting the anesthesia twice in one day. 
I realize it was mild, but it really made me loopy, and I don't really like that feeling. About the time I felt it wore off from the bone marrow thing, I got some more for the catheterization. Also, I didn't much like waiting around all that time between the two procedures. What was that like, uh, five hours or something? But honestly, if this makes me feel better and helps my heart, I guess I'm willing to do what it takes, even if it is unpleasant. While you were interviewing the patient, I received the results of the first month checkup for patient 1. Please record that information on your worksheet, and then interview patient 2. Well, overall, it wasn't too bad. They got me into the catheterization room right away. It's kind of weird being awake, but on happy drugs while this was happening. I had a little bit of pain around the area where the catheter was put in, but nothing much to talk about. Oh, the worst of it was waiting around to get checked out and go home the next day. <laughs> Hospitals are boring, <laughs> but I was comfortable, and I got to read a book I've been wanting to and spend some time with my wife. Altogether, not too bad. I have the results of the first month checkup for patient 2. Please record that information on your worksheet. I let the patients know they can go home for now and will need to report back in a month for their second checkup. Okay, I just heard from the nurse that our two patients are ready for their second checkups, two months after treatment. Patient 1 is reporting that he is feeling better and his results indicate that he is healthier. Please record that information on your worksheet. Just so you know, we are not expecting big changes in the ECG waves or the stress test. His heart is still damaged, so the waveforms will not change significantly. We are just hoping to reduce his symptoms with this treatment, and it at least appears at the moment as if we are doing that. Patient 2 is also reporting that he is doing better, and his life is more like it used to be before the heart attacks led to heart failure. Please record that information on your worksheet. Our next checkup will be in two months, or four months after the treatment occurred. I hope these patients continue to improve. If they do, this could really be a breakthrough medical therapy that will help millions of people get their lives back. The four-month visit will be their final checkup for this study. Obviously, if they need help after that, they have only to call us, but for this study, it will be the last time we do data collection. They're back! And boy, what a difference! Take a look for yourself. I feel great, Doc. I'm still not sure I understand what those cells were supposed to do, but I feel 40 years younger now. I can walk much better, and I don't run out of breath nearly as fast as I used to. I'm really encouraged by the results this patient is showing. Here are his numbers. Please record that information on your worksheet. I have to say, I've been going from strength to strength in the past few months. This new therapy has been great for me. I'm walking a lot farther than I have in a couple of years. I don't feel all bloated, and that persistent cough I had is gone. I'm not ready to run a marathon yet, but I feel like I might be able to walk a mile without keeling over. This patient is also showing excellent results. Here are his numbers. Please record that information on your worksheet. Well, what do you think? Which line of research should we recommend be pursued further? Take a look at all the data and at the patient's reactions. Which procedure has more risks to the patient? Think about what the ultimate cost to the patients, insurance companies, and hospitals would be for these two procedures, and then make your recommendation on the worksheet. I'm going to think about this myself, and we'll come up with a recommendation to the Academic Medical Center. I was delighted to hear from Dr. Pompili that we have two possible ways of helping to repair the heart. 
I'll keep my eye on this as it moves forward to see how we might commercialize one of these therapies and make it available to the millions of people suffering from heart failure. In order for that to happen, one therapy will have to go through two more clinical trials to get approval from the Food and Drug Administration, or FDA. But I'm confident we will ultimately have a new way to treat a common but disabling disease, offering hope to people that currently don't have many options open to them. Thanks again for your help in this critically important research.